Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. This is Coach Tom. This is Shot Science Overtime number one twenty eight. Um, wow. wow. <laughs> you're surprised <laughs> always, every week. Huh? It always amazes me. Yeah. So uh, we just want. Oop, let me turn that guy off. Uh, so we just want to welcome you guys to our live show. This is where we give you guys a topic that we want to talk about for the first, you know, portion of our, of our chat here, and, and maybe give you a topic that we think is going to help you be a better basketball player. So it can be uh, anything that across the spectrum. It could be offense, defense, um, talking to your coach, whatever it is. We're, we're going to give you that topic, and then while we're doing that, you guys are going to send us your questions. So it can be anything basketball related in that case too. So shooting, dribbling, passing, playing defense, athletic conditioning, talking to your coach, whatever that is, send those questions our way and we will do our best to answer as many of those as we can today. And, uh, you know, you can hit us up on anything uh, social media wise. We are on Facebook, we're on Google Plus, we're on uh, YouTube, obviously right here. Um, you can tweet at us. We are at Shot Science and we are at Shot Science pretty much on everything. So send us those questions and we'll do our best to get to as many people as we possibly can. Keep in mind, this is our live show. This is not like a regular video. This is where we're here to help you guys with the questions that you might have. So if this isn't your thing, that's cool. We'll catch you on the next one. Um, okay, so today's topic is making and taking contact. Um, so we get questions all the time about people asking, how do I uh, shoot a layup and, and take contact and still make the, the, the lay-in? Um, how do I create contact uh, playing offense? How do I make sure that I know how to take it? I mean, there's there's tons of questions around that kind of stuff. So one of the things that we want to talk to you guys about is just the fact that you should welcome contact because it, you can use it to your advantage. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So like what are some ways that people can use mm -hmm. it? Well, one of the things that we teach uh, to everybody about attacking the basket <clears throat> is learning how to leverage your body against the defender leveraging meaning that we're going to actually move into that person and try to squeeze them and oftentimes what we're teaching is we're trying to teach them to leverage your defender toward the split line if we're coming over the top of the, the key and we're trying to get into the middle into the lane we want to kind of leverage that person with our body and in other words we're riding him with our body as we go to the basket usually they will get back into you. And so there's kind of a, 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 a little playoff right there uh, uh, as you attack. And, and we, we refer to that as leverage because you're trying to get yourself into position to finish and get that person out of position to contest your shot. Now, if you just go in and, and all of a sudden you just kind of step away and fall away and there is no contact anymore and you put up a hope shot, a uh, hope shot is one that where you're hoping is going to go in and it usually doesn't, uh, then you're not going to be very successful. One of the things that we and also you bail out the defense when you do that, you too. bail out the defense for sure, because okay. I mean, you're essentially trying to avoid the contact that they are trying to to or, or not that they're trying to get on you, but you're trying to avoid the contact. You're going to take a crappy shot in, as as a result, right? Instead of taking the contact and actually getting a foul or maybe even making the shot, right? penalizing them instead of penalizing yourself. Exactly. And, and one of the other things that, that we try to teach our players as well is that as you get closer to the basket, then you gave, you try to give that uh, uh, defender a little extra bump, not one where you're going to get called for anything. And usually that falls under what officials refer to as incidental contact. And so we just lean into them for just a little bump and then kind of step away a little bit and you create space that way to get the, the shot off. Now, you don't take and really go a long ways away because if you bump them a little bit, they're going to separate and you're going to separate so you have a little bit of room to finish. But, uh, you know, contact is such an important part of basketball today when it was uh, a game, you know, 50 years ago or, or 75 years ago, there wasn't so much contact that, that you ran into except for the early NBA where they love to have fistfights uh, during the game. But <laughs> that's a little different program. Yeah, but I think when you look at at contact in basketball, there's different different scenarios where it happens, and you know some of it is is shooting on the shot, um, some of it is during a layup, some of it is when you're playing in the post, and some of it is when you are attacking off the dribble, and then of course when you're playing on defense, there's another right. scenario set there too. Right. So when you are taking a shot, and we just talked about it, but if you're taking a shot, whether it's in the mid range, close in, whatever deep range. 
if you are going to try to avoid contact that's going to happen, then you just bailed out the defense. Yep. Um, if they're going to go and they're going to commit contact on you, you need to accept that. Right. Because the and fact, an- anticipate that it's going to happen because it will. Because the fact of the matter is, is that they are going to be penalized for that. Mm-hmm. And you may still get the benefits of taking the shot. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you just get completely blasted on that and, and the shot doesn't get off. But you, they pick up the foul you get the ball back or you get to shut you get to shoot the the free throws wh- right. whichever the scenario is but if you are trying to avoid the shot or do some double clutch thing or jump away or fade away i mean these are the reasons why we hate fade away shots is because yeah. as soon as you do that your shooting percentage just drops off precipitously yeah. like you you seriously are are taking a shot that is twice as hard and you essentially tell the or give the defense the benefit of of playing garbage defense right. and and bailing them out. So that's that's one of those things where you just need to accept the contact as a positive. Right. Because it only works in your favor. The same thing is true on the layup where if you're going up on a layup and they're going to commit contact on you, then you need to accept it. You need to focus on the finish and you need to put the ball in the basket. Right. You know, you can't be worried about them running into you. You can't be worried about them blocking your shot. If you have proper body position, that's not the kind of thing that's really going to do anything. But if they are going to commit the contact, don't bail them out by doing some double clutch, flip flop, circus shot, or or anything like that. Because right. you will you will be the one that, that is penalized for that. Because you probably will not make the shot. You'll look pretty foolish. And the defense will just get the ball back. Right. But if but if you go up and and they and you accept the, the contact or you even create the contact using a, either a pump fake or you jump into the their body as you're going up, then you are going to get the benefits of that. You will get the shot if you make it. You will get to take the free throws either way. Right. And they get penalized with a foul and a team foul. Right. So you have to take that. You do, and you need to learn how to do that. I, uh, people send us little uh, questions. I have, couple, I have a couple more scenarios after. Go ahead. Go, go for ahead. it. Uh, they send us little questions about, you know, uh, what they need to do when they get the basket. I had a, a student this morning, and 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 uh, just kind of out of the blue, he says, Coach, I, I, I get into the paint pretty easy, but I can't finish. And so I said, well, what do you think the problem is? And he says, I don't know, uh, but – I said, do you usually take and try to take and rearrange your shot when you are contested? Well, yeah. Okay, well, that's something you don't want to do. What you want to do is put the defender in a position where they have to foul you to stop you. And <clears throat> if I reach out here at arm's length to flip one up, there, there may not be any contact, and I'm not going to come close to making the shot, as Casey was talking about a while ago. So we spent time <clears> – <throat> just kind of working on scenarios where he'd finish some of it with contact, some of it without contact. But the idea is learn to accept that contact and deal with it. And then also learn to deliver it yourself to the other person so that you can create openings for yourself on the finish. Well, you see it all the time when you watch like youth basketball as compared to like, let's say NCAA basketball where youth basketball, everybody's so concerned with getting blocked or they're concerned with somebody bumping them or having contact Whereas in the NCAA, those guys are just solid banging, just you know, putting up their shots, not worried about the contact, whatever. So if you if you watch those games that in the youth league, you'll see kids throwing the ball up, flipping it, doing double clutch. Yeah. If you do that in college, your coach will be so pissed because you will have just essentially caused a turnover and not penalized the other team. It's all about being in control. And, and you're not in control if you're the one that's bailing them out and doing those flip-flops. Yeah. So if you want to be a more advanced player, a more kind of um, experienced cerebral player, then you need to do, do it the way that, that we're saying to do it right now and not be the kid that's trying to figure it out on the youth league where doing that kind of stuff is not acceptable. Right. Um, okay. So the now, next- let me <clears throat> embellish that a little bit. One of the things that I think <clears throat> a lot of young players kind of feel is, they don't want that contact. Uh, and the reason they don't want it is they're afraid uh, uh, that it may result in some kind of an injury to themselves. You know, I have over uh, many, many, many years, I've seen maybe a handful of players who have been injured by contact on a finish at the layup. 
and usually it, <clears throat> it has to do with maybe a sprained ankle or maybe they end up going down on their, their tailbone. Once in a while, I can remember uh, a kid or two uh, that hit the floor and banged their head on the back of the floor. That will happen. But the thing is, what you need to do is recognize that uh, physicality in basketball is a very important part of that game today. Well, here's, here's the other thing, too. I think that if you're in a situation where that kind of situation is going to happen, where somebody's going to get hurt like that, yeah. then you need to read that before it happens and, and take control of the situation. So if you see the defender that's coming in and, and flying in and he's just going to clean you out, jump stop, shot fake, put the ball in as he goes soaring past you. Yeah. Um, you don't have to take a guy on that's going you know a, as fast as he can and he's just going to clock you. You don't need right. to do that. Well, um, but, it, but it might happen. And, you know, the thing is, too, is that you have to have the mentality in your mind that you're going to accept contact and be be OK with it. Everybody, you know, not, not everybody, but I would say like a lot of young people, they they're either afraid of it or they're not sure how to how to use it or whatever. And it does take experience to figure all that out. But if you are under if you have the understanding that definitely contact is going to happen in basketball and you're cool with it and you're going to use it to your advantage, then you will be in a much better spot than people that are just like, ooh, I don't want him to touch me. But if you don't want people to touch you, go play tennis, yeah. <laughs> go maybe play baseball or something yeah. like that. Yeah, true. But basketball is a contact sport. It is a contact sport. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so let's go back to the other scenarios that I was talking about. So the other scenario would be like in the post. And if you're a post player, you need to be able to use contact to your advantage. And the way that you do that is that if you have – the defense that is in contact with you, you can use that to know where they are. Yep. Um, it's very difficult to play offensive uh, post play if you have no idea where the defense is and you're you're out there trying to catch the ball in the post. And so if they are playing off of you, you need to make sure you're creating that contact. And and you know you if they're going to fall off of you, then you keep pushing back and you you'll get better and better positioned. Um, but you need to make sure that you know where they are, and that's typically through feeling them through contact. Yeah, usually when you're in the post, you can feel the defensive person behind you because they'll touch you. They'll come up and they'll put a forearm in your back, or you can feel a hand in the middle of your back, which they're not supposed to do, but you can feel that contact. So, and, so okay, but so what, if you go watch our videos on post play, you'll mm -hmm. see things like sealing in the post right. and the release step, to right. catch the pass um and then you know the various moves and stuff those all involve creating contact and then creating space and then creating contact again right. and a lot of that is you know creating contact a lot of that is to know where they are um and then creating the space is to really separate to get a shot or to draw them in and then do another move to get by them right well one of the things to think about uh on defense uh in the post uh, we don't teach our guys to take and come up and put hands on them or forearms on them. We want to have a little space between us and them. And usually it's only a, a, you know, a foot and a half, two feet, so that we can respond to their moves to the basket. When they come up and uh, the defensive person comes up and you can feel them uh, that close to you, we always instruct our guys on how to spin move and get to the basket. And so what happens is that being in contact with you, they're so close, they don't have to, uh, time to respond to your move. And, uh, you know, the spin move that Gasol uses is so effective in going by those people who really get in there and hug you. A lot of them will get in with that forearm and they'll try and hold you off. Uh, and they do a lot of that in college and, 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 um, and uh, professional basketball and they allow the offensive guy just to batter you backwards. I don't understand that yet. And, and you'd think that it would be something that we would know about, but I don't know why they allow it. It's, you know, if you were doing something like that on the forecourt, you never have a chance with it, but that's another kind of contact. Yeah. Well, and the thing too, about playing in the post and using contact, you're going to want to do things like um, use shot fakes, um, jump into the contact or into their body and shield the ball with your body. Um, it's the same, almost the same scenario as like layups and stuff. Sure. You are not going to want to alter your shot just to clear the, the defense or, or not have contact. Because you do that, you will be taking a much lower percentage shot and bailing them out. Draw the contact, 
it, it only benefits you because the the offensive player is typically given all the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if the defense touches you, it's essentially going to be a foul. Uh, now, um, let, let me back up for a second. And that young student they had this morning that we were talking about attacking the basket, I uh, asked him the question if he ever – created contact he says well yeah i do i create contact and i said well when do you do it as soon as i can i want to get my shoulder in their chest well that in itself is going to get you into trouble and i said you get called on that quite a bit yeah i do well then that's not probably a really good thing to do you want to take and learn how to leverage your body not knock them over and so we we went into another process that we teach everybody too, and that is when I get to the basket, if there's nowhere to go, I jump stop immediately, and I take an, uh, I can either reverse turn and pitch the ball out, or there's about three or four moves that we teach, and we're not going to go into those here, but you never want to just take and go in there like a bull in a china closet trying to force your way into the basket. You want to have a plan, a program that allows you to address people who will step out and challenge you. Usually it's going to be a big. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a harder shot, do that backing down, banging thing, because yeah. you will never get a good, solid, open look ever. Yeah. Uh, if you want to be a great post player, learn how to do the finesse moves and and really create space, and you'll wind up taking more layups than you will ever desire to be able to take. Right. But if you're the guy that's just in there just trying to blast a guy, you're going to get tired. You're going to uh, eventually run into guys that are too big for you to even try that. You're going to get called for fouls because occasionally referees do call those. Um, and it's, it's just more difficult shot. Right. Um, okay. And, and you, the other thing too, to kind of bring up in that same realm is the fact that even when you're playing the post or when you're doing a dribble attack on the perimeter, there's a few types of contact that really are to your advantage. And that is doing things like hip to hip ceiling, um, using your, your footwork essentially to, to seal off the guy and that contact right on your hip is really going to make it difficult for them to do anything to catch up with you. And if they do, they're probably going to bump you and get the foul called on themselves uh, at that point. Um, but you're essentially sealing them off and they are behind and they're trying to catch up to you. Um, there's, you know, shoulder to shoulder, hip to hip is essentially the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are not creating contact, this, is, this happens all the time too in, in youth basketball, is that when people are attacking the hoop or doing any kind of dribble attack, they are trying to go out and around their defense yeah. because they don't want to create any contact. They just want to go, uh, they, they just want to avoid that guy completely. The fact of the matter is, is that it really is kind of the shortest distance uh, situation where it's better to go as close to that person as possible, seal them with the the hip to hip and the long one and one, and get that shoulder by them, and then they're going to be completely out of luck, and you you are in in tip top shape at getting to the basket. Well, and it's, it's the more direct route you get there quicker, and you uh, and if you take a loop out around you, he's going to meet you when you get there anyway, because he's going to take the short route with you looping around. So. Make it a straight line. That's what Casey's really talking about in going hip to hip with them. And there will be contact. Yeah, I mean, Look if there, for it. If there is, for it. if there isn't contact, you're not doing it right. Yeah, you're, you're you're going, you're looping out too much. So you want to have that contact. And like I said, if if they move in towards you, or sometimes even if they just try to open that leg up, they will foul you, and they will get the call against them. You guys get the ball again, and they get penalized. And think of in terms of leveraging that contact, using your body to kind of move that guy gradually uh, to a position where you can score with ease. Now, officials probably are going to be, they're going to tend to call a foul on the defense anyway because of that kind of contact. But don't be afraid to kind of leverage yourself in. Don't go in with the idea that you're going to lower a shoulder and, and drive it. The yeah, floor. I mean, that's the thing. If you are doing these unsubtle things that are just blatant fouls, offensive fouls, yeah. you will get called for them because ref referees are always looking for that stuff. And the other coach, he's going to see it and he's going to be on the refs about that kind of thing. So use contact in a very subtle way that makes that makes it so that you get the entire advantage out of it. And it, it will be incredibly frustrating for the defense because they won't know what to do because you're creating this contact and they're not really allowed to do anything about it other than step away from you and kind of give you that that opening. Yeah. Well, um, they may leverage you back because then it kind of is into a, a little pushing program. But if they do that, I mean, it's a foul on them. It could be a foul on them because they don't occupy that space. That's right. And, you know, and here's another 
piece of contact that you can use that that's more subtle as well, but it also eliminates them hand checking you, and that is using something like the hammer. Yeah. Um, so if they have their hand in your in your hip or whatever, and they're trying to guide you, and the referee isn't calling it for some reason, as you use that long one and one, and you're going hip to hip by them, use the hammer, and we have a video on that, and it's essentially just using contact from your wrist on their wrist, and it doesn't feel good. And they will not really want to do that hand check yeah. anymore after that. So go check out our video on the hammer and you'll see kind of that's that's that is some legitimate contact that you are creating that is eliminating them from uh, being able to manipulate you on defense. Yeah. The only problem with that move and you have to be kind of you have to kind of be a little subtle about it is if when you bring that arm up, it elevates up above your hips. But we talk about that uh, in the of, video. Yeah. Sure. The officials oftentimes will will call you. For the foul. Okay. So, so I mean, a lot of times, as as a basketball player, you need to get some experience using this kind of stuff to make sure that you are utilizing it in a way that is subtle yeah. and it isn't something that is super apparent because you are technically bending the rules anytime you are using contact in basketball. Yeah. Um, there is a very fine line between what is is contact, what's foul, what's what's not a foul. Uh, what is incidental, all that kind of stuff. Typically, like we said, the offense is given the benefit of the doubt. So use that to your advantage. And yeah. you can do that by using those things that we talked about. But the number one takeaway from this stuff is that you should not and cannot be scared or afraid of contact if you want to be a basketball player. Because if you are, then like I said, go play tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody will touch you then and you'll be good. But expect contact use it to your advantage don't shy away from it because it will just it will make you a, a, a non-entity a bad uh low percentage basketball player and yep. you don't want that right sounds good all right so we're going to stop that discussion right there hopefully you guys have been sending us your questions and we will dive into those right now if you have a question and you want us to answer it on air right now uh, you can send it to us on Twitter. We are at Shot Science. That's probably the best place. You can leave it here in the chat here on YouTube. Send it to us on Google Plus, wherever we will find it. But we are Shot Science on all those things. Send it in early so that we can get to them and and uh, don't have to pass them by. Um, okay, so we're gonna get to our first question here. This one is from, let's see, Aham Bisu, who says, "Hey, my tryouts are in a month. What do you suggest I should do?" Uh, well, you know, what you should do is you should take and go to our video on our channel, and it's called Make the Team. It explains We have there, a playlist, actually. Actually, well, we do, don't we? Um, but go there and look at those videos, and they kind of give you an insight into what coaches are going to be looking for. And, you know, there's some coaches that don't abide by that, uh, just like there is everything else in the world. But generally, they're looking <clears throat> for guys who will come with some skills and who will play with great effort. Those are things that they really are looking for is effort and uh, the fact that you will play really hard on both sides of the ball. So that, that's probably what I would recommend is go check those out. Yeah, and the fact of the matter is, is that coaches want you to come in as a finished product or as a complete product. Yeah. They don't want to sit, sit there and work on you with uh, maybe you, you come in and your free throws are, are garbage. They don't want to spend time working on developing your free throw shooting if if they don't have to because sure. that is not what they want to do during the season while they're trying to work up the team because they're not focusing on individual skills so much as they want to have a team where the pieces fit together and everybody works uh, somehow cohesively. Right. So if you come in and you're not kind of where you need to be, that can be a situation where you might not make the team. Yeah. Um, if you come in and you have – all the all the skills and everything in place, but you're still kind of a jerk, or you're entitled, or mm -hmm. you're lazy. That's another situation where you might not, might not make the team. So, right. the things that you need to work on leading up to your tryouts, and I would say you're you're probably a little bit behind if you haven't started it already, is getting your skills in place and working on those every day and being a complete player, not wasting any time on casual shoot arounds and all that stuff. You are actually diligently working you're being consistent and you're hitting everything. Well, and another point, let me just throw this in as an interjection, Casey. Uh, when you go there, don't go there with an idea that you're going to play the uh, point guard position. You're going to play the, the post. 
go there looking for a place where you can play as a basketball player. And what will happen is that if you're selected that team, the coach will then take and fit you into the situation where you fit. It may not be something you want to do, but too bad. Uh, if you've got, you made it to the team, he's offering you a spot right here. Take it, take it. And, and allow things to kind of fold because what will happen very possibly is maybe here is a guy that, that they brought, thought was going to be a post player, but he can really stroke the ball. And so they end up moving him out to the uh, uh, away from the basket and facing the basket where he can utilize that skill. So go there looking to become a basketball player on that team, not a point guard, not a two or three or whatever. Well, I mean, the real situation where that – I would say what happens when you come in and you think you're a specific position is that you don't make that distinction when right. you are a player. Yeah, absolutely. The person that makes that distinction is the coach. And so you might come in thinking, I'm a point guard, I'm a point guard, I'm a point guard. And you might approach your play like that um, where you you maybe you have some uh, some thought of a point guard as being the the distributor or whatever it is. And you come in and that's all you're doing. The coach might look at you and say, well, that guy doesn't have a shot, so I'm not gonna, I don't need him. Um, or he might say, well, I have two point guards ahead of that guy. I don't think I need a third one. Uh, we'll just leave him off. Whereas if you come in and you're playing as a basketball player, you're, you're, you're scoring, you're passing, you're playing defense, you're hustling, you're doing all these things, you might find your spot on the team at maybe a two. Yeah. Or maybe maybe a three, or maybe you start off as a two, and then eventually you move yourself into the point guard position. But it's one of those things where if you come in and you have blinders on, and all you're seeing is exactly, oh, I'm point guard or whatever it is, I'm a I'm center, and that's all you do, then that's that's all that's fine. But you might find yourself not making the team. Yeah, you limit your chances absolutely. Be yeah, a basketball player first, and then let the coach decide how he's going to have you play. And that's how it should be, anyways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're a post player and all you come in and all you do is just do some post moves, then the coach might not look at you and say, well, that guy is a really complete player. I need to have him on my team. Whereas if you had come in and sure, you can do the post plays, you can uh, also step out on the perimeter, maybe hit some shots in the mid range, maybe even hit some deeper shots. Maybe uh, you can uh, handle the ball pretty well, play defense inside and out. They are going to want that player way more than they're going to want the guy that is yeah. just the utility guy that can do everything that the five can do. If you can do everything that the one through five can do, they're going to want that guy as opposed to the guy that just does what the five can do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because you can go anywhere. And the other thing is, is that basketball today is it's very like positions are very fluid and they almost don't mean as much as they used to. Yes, that's true. So every guy out there is essentially able to do everything on the court. Especially when you're looking at motion offenses where the players are interchanging positions a lot. So um, be a basketball player first. Yeah, do everything, mm -hmm. no matter no matter if you're five foot or seven foot. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, this one is from Juliet Ume Ezioki in the in the comments. She says, "Hi, I couldn't play select basketball this summer, so instead I spent a lot of time working on my individual skills and watching game footage to improve my basketball IQ. Since I wasn't able to play for any real games this summer, pick up at the gym doesn't really count. I look bad compared to the rest of my teammates that did play select. For instance." I don't take as many shots or get as many rebounds, and then I get even less playing time, which results in less game experience, which results in less confidence and effectiveness on the court. What can I do when I practice at home, like in my drive, driveway, to improve my productivity when I get to playing time and hopefully get more? Well, <laughs> this, is, this is a situation where you probably haven't addressed all three pillars of, the, of, of practice. Absolutely. Um, the three pillars, of, we'll just run through them. We, we do them every week. But the three pillars of practice are the first pillar, which is dialing in and kind of uh, refining your, your mechanics or whatever skill it is that you're, that you're trying to utilize. So if it's shooting, it's going to be something like you're going to use the form shooting drill, break everything down so that it's, okay, I'm, I'm working on getting my elbow in, I'm getting my release here, I'm having you know this type of footwork, whatever it is, you're slowing everything down and you're doing it by yourself. It's kind of individual development. Second pillar is game speed, game intensity. And that's where you're taking that stuff that you were working on in the first pillar, whether it's shooting or dribbling or whatever, and you're amping it up to kind of game scenarios. So maybe you have somebody come play defense against you. Maybe you visualize a defender, um, but you're doing it at the speed and intensity that you would see in a game. 
Um, and that's, that's going to prepare you for the third pillar, which is actual game experience. And that could be pickup games, playing for your school team, traveling team, uh, whatever it is. You are actually playing against people competitively and applying that stuff in the first two pillars. Right. And what that will do is give you experience. But the second pillar prepared you for that because it's not like you're doing it for the first time ever. You've actually worked at that speed and intensity. So I think that you're probably missing out here a lot on that third pillar for sure. Right. And maybe you need to focus a lot on the second pillar where you're getting the game speed, game intensity stuff in as well. Well, you know, something comes to my mind here. You're thinking that these <clears throat> other people that played um, uh, their, their, uh, uh, on their select team or whatever, that they're getting an awful lot of, of uh, playing time uh, that you're not getting. Well, that's true. But what Casey's saying is this. You can get the, a, a, uh, uh, the same kind of experience if you take and go and pay, pick up games at different places. And they don't have to be against select players, but probably would help if they are. But get out and play. It doesn't have to be a a, uh, a select basketball summer team or whatnot. <clears throat> Just get out and play and play with a lot of different people. One of the things that we encourage uh, our students to do too is when they get out, don't go play with play, uh, with people who are uh, an equal to you or worse than you are as a player. Or not serious. Or or, or not serious. Go out and find people who are a little older and uh, will give you more problems and help you develop. And, and then you have, you have to go play them and play them on their level. Uh, and it's really important that you will develop that skill. When I was a kid, we didn't have summer teams. Um, and that's how we spent our summers. We go out and we had a junior high school that we played at all day Saturday. And another one maybe we go play at all day Sunday. And so the, the point is, is that we were getting out and playing those games and they weren't necessarily uh, um, those travel team games. They don't have to be. Might help you some if you're playing travel team, but you know there's not enough really uh, good coaching that goes on on many of those uh, select travel teams anyway. So yeah, and the fact of the matter is, is that you have to make that stuff happen. Yeah. Just because you don't make a select team or whatever, or couldn't play or you're injured. You need to figure out a way to make that kind of stuff happen, and that might mean going out and playing on uh, some playground or yeah. or setting things up or going to an open gym or whatever it is. Inviting you, a bunch of friends to just go play. I mean, that that really is a part of it all. Well, I can guarantee you that in every single city or pretty much any town, you will find a basketball court and there will be people playing on it. Yep, there will be. You don't have to know those people to go play. Right. Okay. Next one here is from... Kawacha Dink Dong, who says, uh, what type of shot is the most effective in your opinions? That <laughs> well, is, that's actually easy. We will tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> our shooting philosophy is to have the most efficient shot possible, whereas you are eliminating all of the um, complexities and variables that don't need to be a part of the shot. So the thinking there is that if you do that, you are cutting out all the things that can go wrong in your shooting mechanics. Um, you know, if you have an extra hitch or your, or your arms go another direction before they elevate or you dip the ball or your, your footwork is, is kind of wonky or whatever, or you lean back or you lean forward or you lean to side to side or you jump for whatever it is. There's so many of these variables you add into your shot. And if you think about it, your shooting mechanics or your shot is already very complex. Yeah. You're trying to coordinate everything. You're utilizing everything in your body to get this ball from a distance to the rim. So you want to make that as easy as possible by eliminating all the non-essentials. And so our philosophy is to keep it as efficient as possible. Do, do the, uh, use the fundamentals of shooting, and we talk about them in all of our videos, and eliminate everything else. Yeah. There is no little tick or trick or added thing that will make you uh, a better shooter. If you just use the mechanics that are the fundamentals, you will be in good shape. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, after reading that, uh, this thought comes to mind. It says, what type of shot is most effective in your opinion? I'll give you two shots that are most effective. The free throw and the layup. Those are the most efficient shots in basketball, the most effective. And yet... Uh, we're not very effective as players uh, sometimes with our free throws. There's no, there's no defense. There's not that much pressure. Um, you're standing there all by yourself, 
15 feet from the basket, and that is an effective shot you should make. Now, in my opinion, every player that plays the basketball game should be above 75% in games when they shoot free, uh, shoot free throws. Even that's low, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you are a basketball player and you shoot anything lower than 80% from the free throw line, you should – you should kind of not feel so great about yourself. Yeah, right. You need to really do some work. Um, and the thing about it is, is that you should, if, if, unless you're shooting 100% from the free throw line, you should always be working on your free throws. And the fact of the matter, uh, well, I mean, the real issue there is that if if you aren't taking that seriously, you will find that you will you will not be an effective player if people are going to be creating contact and stuff with you. You need to be able to sink those free throws. Yeah. Absolutely. Have to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it depends on how you read that question. Yeah, right. Um, but I would say that the most efficient type of shot, pe people say, what is the one motion shot or two motion shot? That's not a thing. If you are shooting with hitches in your shot, and that two, two motion herky-jerky thing where there is a stopping point, that is not efficient. That is, that is a kind of a, a, not a good way to go because you are having a point in your shooting mechanics where your power is stopping. Yep. And you don't want to do that. Watch somebody that is an efficient shooter like Clay Thompson or Stephen Curry or, you know, fill in the blank. I mean, there's so many of them. They are very efficient shooters. They're they're going straight up in their shot and there is no extra motion necessary. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's go to the next question here. Um, this one is from me moan Balfaf, who says, hello, uh, help me with jumpers knee in my knee. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. We are not doctors, so we cannot give you advice on that at all. Um, other than you should go see a doctor if you are in pain or it hurts or it's an injury. You need to go get that checked out. We will say that jumper's knee and Osgood slaughters and what all, all that kind of stuff is very common. Yep. And doctors and, and anybody that is kind of in that field will be able to help you figure out a, a, a recovery re approach or make it less painful or whatever, but we cannot give you advice on that. Yeah. There is no real fix that we can give you. You gotta go to the doctor and yeah, check that do. out. And it's no big deal. It happens to a lot of people. Um, okay, let's see here. Chandler TV is asking if we've already talked about making the contact we have, but if you have questions about it, we can go and, and, and cover that again. So just let us know. Um, Kwacha Dink Dong is asking us, what's the most effective dribble moves? <laughs> Well, you know, <clears throat> the most effective dribble moves are the moves that you create that you have the most confidence in. That's the most effective. We could tell you that the best one would be a flat back attack. We could tell you that a quick uh, scissor move through the legs is the best. But it really depends on what you're able to do, uh, not so much what we think is the best, because everybody is a little better at one or the other. For example, if we're taking and, and talking about Allen Iverson, he has the great crossover, okay? And for him, that is his best move. You may be talking about somebody else and maybe there's as a spin move that is their most effective. So it kind of depends on the person that we're, we're looking at, what everybody maybe is a little bit different. And, and the execution of those moves are the things that uh, make them effective. Through practice and practice and practice. Your approach on it is way more important than which move somebody might think is the most effective because yeah. it, 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 they all are effective. Otherwise, they wouldn't be moves. Yep. So what our approach is is that we think you should pick two to three dribble attacks that you think are the ones that you want to build up and work on. Right. So that could be the crossover. It could be the hesitation. It could be uh, the in and whatever it is, you pick that and then build counters off of those dribble attacks. Right. So if you work on the crossover dribble, you're going to definitely want to have the counter be like the in and out because the in and out looks like the crossover. So if you beat that guy a couple times with the crossover, you throw in the in and out, and he's trying to anticipate the crossover, and you just went the other way because you use the in and out dribble instead. Yeah. Um, and you know The same thing is true with, with any of the other dribble attacks. You want to make sure that you have kind of this – arsenal where maybe you don't have everything uh kind of polished so that it's the, you know a move that you're utilizing every time but so that you have like these specialty moves that you can use that give you an option to do anything right right <coughs> excuse me so make sure you have that approach more than which is we're not going to rank anything in terms of what we think is the most effective because it really depends on the person too 
Um, okay, this one is from Jackson Ringer, who says, Coach, how do I get rid of nerves? I seem to get nervous before some practices and games, and it affects my performance. I know that I'm better than what I'm showing in some of these practices and games. My coach and teammates have seen me at my best and have been impressed, but recently I've seemed to choke more often. What can I do so that I can beat the mental game and my emotions don't get the best of me? Okay, one thing is, is you can't live in the past or in the present or in a past or in the future. You need to live in the present with anything you do in basketball. So you're not worried about the shot that you missed. You're not worried about the shot you're going to take in two minutes. You're worried about just playing right now and creating the best opportunity that you can. Um, if you're, if you are allowing your nerves to get to you uh, because you're nervous about performing across the game, that's going to be something that's going to be very overwhelming. So you got to kind of let that stuff go. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that oftentimes when we start having these little breakdowns, we begin to develop fears that we'll fail. And usually we will. Uh, in fact, that's a part of the game. Everybody that plays the game of basketball uh, has failures. Nobody plays perfect basketball. Nobody plays perfect sports ever. Some are better than others, but uh, what we do is we put ourselves in this little uh, uh, box where we think that we have to be perfect. What you really need to be able to do is to let go of all of that, the fears that you have about, uh, and most of those fears have to do with failure, that, that you're going to disappoint yourself, you're going to disappoint your coach, you're going to disappoint your teammates. What you really need to do is let all of that go and just go play. And whatever falls, falls. And, and um, you know, I was talking to a young man. I've talked about him a couple times today. Uh, this morning, he was so frustrated because he wasn't hitting most every shot. And I finally asked him, I said, well, why are you frustrated? Well, I'm not hitting shots. And I said, well, how many do you think you should make? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, if you shoot 100 shots here, how many do you think you should make? I think I should probably make 70 or 80 of them out of 100. And I said, you are dreaming nobody's going to do that. Even in practice, it's really difficult for you to take and, and make that many shots out of a hundred shots. In reality, what's going to happen is this. You're probably going to be somewhere in practice, somewhere between 35 and 45% and maybe a little bit higher once in a while. Okay. That's just the frailty of, of but, your, but your here, shot. Here's the other thing is that you need to, if you're taking shots, especially in a game, you are just taking shots that are, are, you know, each shot is its own thing. Yes. If you're worried about anything outside of that one shot, you've already kind of counted yourself out. Right. So focus on taking, uh, you know, a hundred great shots instead of taking, uh, you know, a hundred shots that are great or whatever, you know, whatever the saying is, make sure you're focusing in on each one of those things. And the other thing is, is that you have to change your mental approach so that you're not holding on to all this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, every player that is a great player has tons of confidence and they know that if they're going to take a shot, the shot is good. And they know if they step on the floor, they're going to do well, even if they don't and something happens and breaks down or they turn the ball over or they get blocked. It's like they they don't care. Like that is wipe from their mind. Uh, you know, if you watch great players and they they, uh, you know, get blocked or something like that, three plays from now, they they don't even remember that because they have come down the floor the next time and they are ready for the next opportunity and they're going to take that opportunity. Exactly. If you watch people that are the sulkers and the guys that just, they can't get over it or whatever, they're the ones that never really uh, become the great players because they, they are just, they, that is not the mentality to have to be successful. Yeah. They dig a hole through because of frustration. And you know, one of the things I'm always telling uh, our, our students is this, is that if you allow frustration into the picture, you are going to be so frustrated and you're going to reach a level and you'll never go above that because well, you're too worried about failure. Uh, screw that. That's, what you really need to do is this focus on the fact that it's a very positive thing all the time. Um, here's like an analogy thing. Um, can you turn that off? Oh, uh, I turn off. It's, I think it's your phone. But here's here's the thing. Here's like an analogy. Like if you are a warrior and you're out and not like not a Golden State warrior, but a warrior and, and you're fighting with your sword out in the field or whatever, if somebody is going to come and they're going to, you know, cut your arm, if you're the guy that's going, oh, my God, he cut my arm, he cut my arm. And you're wandering around going, oh, my God, he cut my arm. I can't believe he cut my arm. 
that that makes you a poor warrior. But if he cuts your arm, you're like, oh, God, and then you get back into the game and you're actually going back at it, then you're going to be a successful warrior. Same thing is true with basketball. If you're worried about, oh, my God, the guy stole the ball from me. I can't believe he took the ball. Oh, my God. Then you have just totally made yourself – you know, a, a, a non-entity in terms of your effectiveness. So you need to get past all that stuff. Yeah, um, it, it's hard to do, and yeah, it is that's hard. why we spend enough time talking about it. It's just, it's, <laughs> it, you know, mentally you just have to kind of just let it go. You absolutely do. Um, all right, let's see here. I think we had some Twitter ones too. Um, this one is from. Let's see here. Brandon Wong, who is at Brandon Wong 2017 on Twitter. He says, which current NBA point guard would you suggest a young player model their game after? Okay. Well, we talked about this already. We don't think you should model your game after anybody. Exactly. We are strong believers. And I think that if you talk to most people that are kind of elite level trainers and coaches, they will tell you the same thing. You are your own person. You need to start with the fundamentals and build up from there. If you're trying to be Kyrie Irving and you've never picked up a basketball, that is a huge jump to make without any kind of stepping stones. And then you also have to consider the fact that you don't have the bodies or the abilities or the athletic uh, conditioning of those players. So it's almost impossible to style yourself after anybody other than yourself. You know, I could go out there and I could say, I want to shoot just like Kevin Durant. But the fact of the matter is, is that I'm six foot two. My wingspan is six foot three, six foot four, like most normal people. But if you go look at Kevin Durant, he's he's like six eleven now, and he probably has a wingspan that is way over seven foot, probably seven three, seven four, something like that. Those are not normal proportions for people. Yeah. So if I try and I try to emulate the way that Kevin Durant does stuff. I'm going to find myself not able to do it and it's not most effective for my body type. So I, I think you would suggest too, we would suggest that you start with the, the fundamentals, kind of the essentials that everybody has built into their, their shooting or their skills, skills yeah. from the, from the start and build out from there because you will become much more effective using your body the way that it needs to be used than trying to force, uh, you know, I want to, I want to be just like Steph Curry. You're not Steph Curry. You are you. And the way that Steph Curry got to where he is, is he started with the fundamentals and built himself up through consistent practice, through diligent practice, through dedication and application. So you need to really do all of those things if you want to be a great shooter. Yeah. Don't emulate anybody. Yeah, that whole thing that, that came around with Michael Jordan about I want to be like Mike, hey, uh, that is the wrong approach to take. You want to be like you. You want to be able to have the skills maybe like Mike or like Kyrie Irving, but you develop them so they fit you. Yeah, it was I think it was Charles Barkley around the same time said that he didn't that he didn't want to be a role model or something like that. And it's like <laughs> that's the way that it should be. You shouldn't yeah. you shouldn't look at those people as like who you want to be. I mean, it's good to look up to those people. That's fine. Yeah. But look up to the fact like how did they get there? Look at how Ray Allen made himself one of the greatest players of all time while also still playing at 40 years old. Yeah, right. You know, he did that through how he practiced the game and how he developed his skills. Be the person that dedicates yourself uh, to doing that kind of thing in emulation, not trying to make yourself look like or play like so-and-so. Right. right. All right. This one is from Johnson, who is at Chandler underscore eight on Twitter. He says, is it possible to dominate the paint if you're a small player? Well, of course. Well, of course. Now, there's a different way of dominating. Um, uh, if you're a post player, maybe you dominate because of your size and, and skills and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, you can, as a smaller player, you can dominate paint. Just the fact that you can get in there and you can deli deliver the ball to other people or you can get a shot off, uh, you can finish around the basket. So dominating the paint as far as i'm concerned you're kind of talking is are you going to be effective in that particular area as a scorer as a player yeah and if you want like a real time or a real like nba example of that look at somebody like charles barkley who you know he was listed at six six he was probably more like six four six yeah. five because they always kind of fiddle with that stuff when it comes to nba players but you know, he was he was a, just a load of a dude who would, was able to rebound. He was able to post up those seven foot guys, throw those guys around. I mean, a lot of it is about using deception and using your body and leverage, using those finesse post moves 
th that's really the way that you can dominate. And it doesn't matter if you're six feet tall and going up against seven foot guys there, you can get shots off. You can, uh, block those guys out. Um, you know, there, it, you can, you just have to have the tools really is all it's about. Yep. Um, but you know, the thing is, is that, uh, you, you have to know how to use that stuff too. You can't just, uh, figure you're, you're going to go muscle those guys because yeah, that, that doesn't work very well. Um, <laughs> okay. This one is from somebody whose name is in a language I can't pronounce. Um, they say, I want video on how to improve dribble skills. Well, we have a ton of those videos. We do. If you go to our YouTube channel, you will see that there is a playlist for dribble attacks, offensive moves, um, pretty much any kind of aspect of basketball you're looking for. If you go in there, you'll be able to find that stuff. And, you know, we have drills on, on how to improve your dribble skills. We have tutorials on how to develop um, dribble attacks um, and how to just really build up your, your dribbling from the ground up. Right. So check that out. Um, okay, let's see. I think we're going to end it there, you guys. We got to get out of here. But we want to thank you for all the questions. If you want to have us at, answer your question next week, we'll be here 1 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday to have another round. If we didn't get to your question today, it's not because we didn't like you. It's because we just ran out of time. Um, if you could follow us on all our social media stuff, we are at Shot Science on Twitter. We are Shot Science on Facebook. We're doing cool stuff there all the time, every day, every day, posts all over the place. Google Plus, we're a Shot Science. Subscribe to us on YouTube where all our videos go up. And make sure you follow us on Instagram and also on Snapchat where we do behind the scenes stuff, some secret drills, um, and kind of, you know, the events and stuff that we go to. So uh, make sure you follow us on all those places and we will make sure to see you guys next time, right? All right. See you guys later. See Thank ya. you.